the Comic Weekly Man, this jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. And I'm still laughing whenever I think of the look on your face when I tricked you with that riddle about Mr. Bigger's baby. <laughs> uh-huh, yes. And I've been spending the whole week thinking of that myself. And I am going to trick you today. You are? I am. Here's uh-huh. a riddle for you. Uh-oh. What coat is always wet when you put it on? Oh, a raincoat when you're out in the woods. Ah, but this coat is wet when you put it on in the house. I give up. What is, uh, what kind of a coat is always wet when you put it on? <laughs> <laughs> a coat of paint. Oh, you fooled me. You tricked me. You hung me on a hook. <laughs> you bet <laughs> I did. Just the way you did to me last week. <laughs> I don't mind, though, if you laugh at me, because I just love riddles. Oh, you are a very good sport. Thank you. Now, will you read me the funny? Puck the comic weekly. Mm-hmm. Very well. I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. <laughs> Here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy, who had been posing as an outlaw, has tricked the chameleon and his gang of outlaws by leading them into Echo Canyon, where he has said he had hidden $40,000 in loot. While they are there, the Texas Rangers sweep into the canyon. And before the outlaws know it, they're surrounded, and they surrender. As the outlaws come out from behind the rocks like worms into the sunlight, the leader of the rangers says, Well, the chameleon and his gang have staged their last raid, Cassidy. I'll help the boys round up the strays. Hoppy looks around at the crew of outlaws and then exclaims, Hey, Grief's Mount is gone. Those are fresh tracks leading out of here. <laughs> First picture, second row, Grief, who's the chameleon, looks back over his shoulder, sees a cloud of dust following his trail. He turns off into a clump of trees, reins in, and waits. As the horseman gallops by, he exclaims, Ah, Cassidy, headed for Buckskin. Well, that town won't be healthy for Simon Grief. He dismounts and starts to open his blanket roll. One more disguise ought to get me out of the country. That night, after dark, a stranger rides unnoticed into Buckskin. A stranger wearing tattered clothes and a gray beard. Last picture, second row, he slips into Grief's office. He hurries to this office safe. First picture, bottom row. Unlocks it. And swiftly empties it, stuffing wads of bills into a sack. Then he hurries to the door. Stops on the landing in surprise. For facing him are a group of local citizens carrying guns, and one of them says, The masquerade's over, chameleon. We were tipped off that you'd be showing up in one form or another. You made the mistake of heading for this office. Last picture, Hoppy steps forward and says, You better open that sack and start returning the money you stole from these folks' grief. This time, it's your turn to pay for protection till the Texas Rangers get here. he tried to blame Hoppy for the robberies, and he would have made Hoppy be hanged. Yes, he would have. Well, now the end of the trail has come for grief and his outlaws. And I'm glad because I love to see justice triumph in the end. So do I. Oh, and next week is Hoppy going to start a new adventure, huh? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I can hardly wait. But you will have to wait. Now? Well, now, let's turn over to page three because Prince Valiant's always there. Very well, then, over the page we go to page three, and you are right. Oh, look, he's still trying to train that hawk he caught last week. Yes, Val and the leader are interested in the form of sport that was very popular in the days long ago, a sport called falconry. Yes, and that was when they would catch a hawk or a falcon and train it to catch other birds and bring them back to their masters. Yes, that's right. 
Well, let's see what happens next in the training of these hawks. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Valiant wagers he can train a hawk better than Alita. Too late, though, he finds she's training a young bird from the nest, while he must catch and train a hawk that is nesting and in summer molt, which means his bird is more nervous and very difficult to train. Day after day, Val carries the great falcon on his wrist, a hood over its eyes so it can't see where it is. Always he caresses it with gentle hand and voice, feeding it by hand. Then the hood is removed, but... The leash is still tied to its leg, so it must always fly back to Val's hand for its food. Then last picture top row. At last comes the anxious day when the leash is removed and the hawk is flown free at the elusive lure. Every time it is allowed to strike, a morsel of meat is the reward. Hope of this reward will bring the bird back to its master whenever Val whirls the lure. A lure is a group of feathers that looks like a small bird on the end of a whip. And when Val wants the hawk to strike, he whirls the whip around in the air, and the hawk, which is sailing through the air, dives for it, seeking to catch it in his claws. One day, as Val is returning to the castle, first picture, next row, happy that his stolen hawk is behaving so well, he encounters the king, a golden eagle upon his padded glove. Well, can it be, sire, that you're practicing in order to edge into our wager? Last picture, second row, the king answers, You're my son... I, uh, I would consider it unsporting to wager against a husband so silly that a clever wife could delude him into making a stupid bet. First picture, bottom row, Val shouts, I'll wager, I'll wager that even now my falcon can bring down more game than that flea-haunted buzzard of yours. Last picture, at dinner that evening, Alita announces to Val and Queen Aguar what the contest will be. She says... At tomorrow's dawn, we go a-hawking. And at evening, each will dine only on what game he brings to bag. And may the worst hawk bring in a woods kitty. What is a woods kitty? <laughs> a woods kitty is a skunk. Oh, you mean if the hawk catches a skunk, then that person will have to eat it? Yep, that's Salida's joke. Well, I think that's a funny contest. Whatever the bird catches, they'll have to eat. Yes. My, I'm anxious to see what happens next week. So am I. Now would you like to see what crazy thing Dagwood does today? Oh, you know I would. All right, let's go to the first page of the second section. And there's Dagwood and Blondie. Say the magic words with me. Ram a poo, ram a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure music, music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> day down at the office. Mr. Dithers sees Dagwood coming toward his office and exclaims, Uh-oh, here comes Bumpstead, and he looks like he's going to ask me for a raise. Oh, I've got to outwit him. In walks Dagwood with a big smile on his face. Well, good morning, Mr. Dithers. How are you? Dithers shakes his head sadly, leans back in his chair. Oh, terrible, terrible. Didn't sleep a wink all night. My sciatica, you know. The smile drops from Dagwood's face. Gee, I didn't know you had that. Dithers pretending to be very sick, sighs, laughs at your top row. Oh, it's nothing compared to my rheumatism and my ulcers. A tear comes to Dagwood's eye and drops to the floor. He helps Mr. Dithers over to the sofa. Gee, you are in a bad way. Hey, you better lie down, boss. Oh, it's the insomnia, though, that really gets me. From business worries, you know. You yeah, sure, sure. Well, you, 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 just, you just rest, boss. Dagwood gives Mr. Dithers a pat on the head. Now, are you comfy? Dithers nods his head, closes his eyes, and Dagwood tiptoes out. Dithers thinks, <laughs> Ah, that did it. I got rid of him. He's scared to ask me for a raise now that he thinks I'm dying. <laughs> now, just as Dagwood gets to the door, he meets a salesman who is about to come in. Last picture, second row. Dagwood stops him. Wait, stop! You can't see Mr. Dithers today. He's a very sick man. The salesman exclaims, well, sick, huh? Say, that's interesting. What's the matter with him? Dagwood enumerates first picture, third row. He's got sciatica, rheumatism, ulcers, insomnia, high and low blood pressure, neurotis, and phlebitis. Well, I'm glad to hear this. And the salesman walks toward the elevators. Suddenly, Mr. Dithers leaps out of his office. 
Doc Stagwood on the head. Bumstead, you nitwit! That was the insurance examiner. Now they'll refuse me my new policy. The salesman hears the commotion and hurries back. First picture about him, row, he sees Ditter beating up on Dagwood. You know yet, numbskull! The salesman shouts, Wonderful! Magnificent! Ditter's who's choking Dagwood looks up as the salesman beams, Such vitality! Such vigor! Why, you're in perfect health, Mr. Ditter's. I'm going to grant you the policy. <laughs> A few minutes later, Mr. Dithers is back in his office, a big smile on his face, happy that he's got the insurance policy. And then in walked Dagwood. Uh, Mr. Dithers, I'd like to talk to you about a raise. A smile drops from Mr. Dithers' face. And he groans, Now I'm really sick. Well, I don't see why Mr. Dithers should be unhappy. After all, Dagwood, in a way, helped him get the insurance policy when Mr. Dithers beat up on Dagwood. Yes, and that proved he was in good health. And you'd have to be healthy to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that because Roy knows that X. Sneed is the crook who's been stealing Pauline Bunyan's logs. Yes, Sneed has tried to escape from Roy by running out on the logs that are being sent down the river. But Roy... Went after Sneed in a rowboat and lassoed him. And then the river current caught the boat and is carrying it right into the path of the log. And if the logs hit the boat, they'll crush it. And then maybe Roy will be drowned dead. Yes, well, let's read now and see what happens to Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. Ayip, ayo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Ayip, ayo. <laughs> Sues him, etch falls in the river in the path of the log. Hey, uh, help! Help! Help with! Quickly, Roy pulls on the rope. Falls etch into the boat. There, yes, Sneed. Save you to answer for pirate and five thousand dollars worth of Pauline Bunyan's timber. Yeah. Yeah, you saved me from drowning, Roger. But we'll both be smashed to a pulp. We're caught between the Bunyan River Drive and, and that. Roy looks up and sees a log jam at the river's bend where several of the logs have locked together to form a big dam. And if the jam breaks, the logs will plunge down on Roy and his life won't be worth a cent. At this very moment, on the other side of the jam, Etch's men are setting an explosion to break the jam so the logs will flow on down the river. And then in the boat, last picture top row, Etch exclaims, Hey, Rogers, the log busted the oar. The boat's turning sideways. We're going to... We're done for. At that moment, Roy sees Trigger on shore and shouts, Come on, Trigger! Trigger gallops down to the river. Roy flips a rope over his neck, and just in time, because... First picture bottom row of the explosion set by Etch's men goes off, and the logs leap forward at the boat. Go, Trigger, go! Trigger turns and trots away, and in a moment, Sneed and Roy are safe on shore. A little later, Roy's tying up Etch. The girl, Wildwood, rides up. And Aunt Pauline comes along carrying Etch's two men, one under each arm. And she exclaims, I found these two hiding in the timber. Thanks to their blast, my logs will reach the sawmill in time. And Roy says to Aunt Pauline, Yeah, and here's the head of the gang all ready to turn over to the sheriff. <laughs> on his way back home. As he rides along under the open sky, he says, Yes, sir, it's sure nice to get back to the peace and quiet of the range, Trigger. But around the bend, behind a bush, a man with a gun in hand waits. We'll find out more about him next week. Now, would you like me to read Flash Gordon? Oh, yes, please. All right, I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Flash Gordon. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rega rega doon doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. The sun's rays have been cut off from the earth, and an ice cap covers it. Flash is on an expedition to discover the cause. He's 
learn that the giants from the planet Saturn are seeking to conquer the world. Flash is captured by the giants after he had destroyed the generator that shut off the sun's rays. Now he's been taken to the moon Rhea. Returning to the Saturnian moon of Rhea after invading Earth, the giant Rug is welcomed by his daughter Kara, first picture. Rug orders her and his son Sami to guard Flash and teach him to speak Rian. The Saturnian giant's plan is to force Flash to disclose vital information about the Earth's defenses. Kara stares curiously at the Earthman as she bids him to go with her and Sami to their home. She explains the Rian words with simple gestures. Flash follows her last picture top row. Due to the moon's very light gravity, the huge Rians lope along with 50-foot leaps. Flash manages to keep up with them, but his gasping lungs burn with cold fire in the ammonia-filled air. Surprisingly, it is Sami who collapses, first picture bottom row, as they approach the fantastic ice castle, which is his home. Flash eases his bursting lungs with a whiff of medigas while he studies the sick and shaken giant. Kara's torrent of words is merely gibberish to Flash, but her tone shows that she is frightened by her brother's seizure. Flash examines Sami, and a quick glance at Sami's contorted features reveals to Flash that Kara has real cause for concern. The Rian giant has caught smallpox, probably from an Eskimo back on Earth. Alarmed at the speed with which the illness seems to be taking effect, Flash hoists Sami to his shoulder and carries him into the ice castle, last picture. Kara's cold glare makes it plain that she blames Flash for her brother's plight. And Flash senses that if the Rian giant dies, his own life will be forfeit. No, it wasn't. But sometimes people blame others just because they want to have someone to blame. Yes, I know that's true. They say it's your fault when it isn't. You're so right. Well, we'll find out what happens to Flash inside the castle next week. Now, how would you like to read Uncle Remus? Oh, yes. And there he is, right across the page. So here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Brer Fox and Brer Weasel was holding a confab about Brer Rabbit, who's always the silent partner. Yes, Brer Fox and Brer Weasel are thinking of a scheme of how to get rid of Brer Rabbit forever. They're out in the woods behind some bushes discussing a plan. Brer Rabbit, who is on his way home in the woods with a pail of axle grease, stops behind a tree, and he hears, Brer Weasel, we has got to eliminate Brer Rabbit. Once and forever. And he hears Burr Weasel say, Ah, seconds of motion, Br'er Fox. Br'er Rabbit grins, and a scheme of his own pops in his mind. He goes to the creek nearby, where a path of stone shows above the water. Br'er Rabbit crosses the stones and then starts backing up across them, smearing the stones with axle grease. And he says, The first I cross is over, and then I backs up while I set my little trap. <laughs> Short time later, Br'er Fox and Br'er Weasel are coming down the road. When suddenly, from out of the bushes, pops Br'er Rabbit. And he dances around saying, Yeah, 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 I double dare you. Br'er Fox screeches, After him! Br'er Rabbit disappears down the road like a streak of lightning. When he reaches the creek's edge, he makes a quick turn to the left. And disappears into some bushes. And then, over the top of the hill, last picture top row, comes Br'er Fox and Br'er Weasel. <laughs> Her weasel yelps. Yeah, he's trapped. <laughs> Down the hill they come straight for the creek. Of course, they don't see Br'er Rabbit hiding in the bushes. First picture bottom row, Br'er Fox yelps. He must across the creek. Br'er Weasel leaps to the rock, yelling. After him. Suddenly, their feet slip out from under them. Arr, arr, hey, I want my footstar. Up in the air they go and land with a crash on the rocks. And as they lie in the creek, last picture, half conscious. Br'er Rabbit comes out of his bushes and goes down the road. Well, now that the meeting is adjourned, I'll be fashioning along with what's left of my axle grease. And Uncle Remus says, The stepping stones to learning uh, is slippery. <laughs> Wasn't that a good trick that Br'er Rabbit played on that old fox and that old weasel? <laughs> it certainly was. Painting the stones slippery so that when they jump to the stones, they'd fall down. <laughs> Here's a cute trick. You bet he is. 
Well, now I'll bet you'd like to read Dick's adventure. You bet you're right. Very well, then. Let's go over to the last page of the second section. Last page right. of the second section. Yes, and here he is. And you remember Dick was captured by the Indian chief Tecumseh. Yes, and that was in the early days of America. Tecumseh wants Dick and his dad, who are expert gunsmiths and iron workers, to show his Indian braves how to repair guns. And Dick uh, and his dad said that they wouldn't. So then Tecumseh asked if they would teach his braves to make tools for agriculture so they could live peaceably. And Dick and his dad promised to teach the Indians how to do that. Yes, they did. But then one night, Dick saw some British officers going into Tecumseh's hut. But the British were enemies of the Americans at that time, and I wonder if Tecumseh is going to join the British. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick That's some music for adventurous Dick. the red-coated British officers go into Tecumseh's hut. He has a good idea that the British are trying to turn the Indians against the Americans. And he's right, because last picture top row, a British officer is saying to Tecumseh, Gather together, your young men, Tecumseh. The king will give his loyal children guns and ammunition to drive back the Americans, whose only wish is to take away your ancient lands. First picture, next row, Dick and his dad look at Tecumseh's hut. His dad is saying, Hey, Tecumseh's no fool, Dick. He ought to know the king's promises mean nothing. We went through all that in 1776. Suddenly, Tecumseh is standing before them. Are my friends saying anything I should hear? Dick sees the British officers leaving the place. Last picture, second row. He exclaims, Tecumseh, don't believe the king's men. They'll promise anything. Come on our side. The country's growing. It's for all people, all colors, all religions. We're all Americans, and we want you to live and work with us. Tecumseh listens in silence and then says, We still believe in the king. But Tecumseh, there'll be a battle here in Tippecanoe. You're going to lose. I know, I know. And Dick continues to plead. Tecumseh, listen, listen, listen. And then the figure of Tecumseh fades. And before Dick's eyes, another face slowly becomes clear. It's his dad, wearing the clothes of today. And Dick is awake again in his own room. His dad leans over him, last picture, saying, Here, 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 it's no use shouting Tecumseh, Dick. He's been dead nearly a century and a half. You've been dreaming again. But that dream that Dick had, that really happened. You bet it did. And Tecumseh wouldn't listen to Dick. And Dick didn't want them to fight because he knew the people would be killed and he wanted the Indians to be friends of the Americans. Yes, well, we'll find out more about that next week. Maybe Dick will have another dream about Tecumseh. I hope so. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, and Rusty and his friend Pete had escaped from the cave where the, those thieves had locked them up. That's right. And at the same time that they had escaped... Sir Percival and Nobbs had reached the abandoned house where they'd hidden the trophies that they'd stolen from Mr. Miles' safe. And I'll bet you they'll learn in a minute that those trophies aren't where they hid them. Oh, this is getting so exciting. Well, let's read now. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty and Pete found an underground river that leads them out into the open. They still aren't free, though. They find themselves in a canyon. Tall walls rise on the sides of them. The only escape is to climb. They make their way up. Rusty says, Now, careful now, Pete. Don't slip. This is no cinch, but it's the only way out, and it's going to be real dark soon. Yeah, I, I, I'm watching my step, Rusty. There are only about 40 feet more to go. Finally, they make it reach the top and find themselves on level land. Rusty looks around and points. Hey, there's a farm over there. Let's head for it. They might have a phone. <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture top row. In the abandoned house, Sir Percival has been digging in the spot where he buried the trophies. Finally, he stops and exclaims with a sigh, Here, Nobby, you dig for a while. We must have buried those trophies deeper than I thought. Nobbs takes the shovel. Okay, boss. But it seems to me we're in such an hurry that we buried them pretty shallow. He prods around the hole a bit, then says first picture next row. Now it's no use, boss. 
Them two kids must have found him while we had him trapped down here. They had plenty of time. The Percival grunts. Yes, maybe, Nobby. But they didn't take him out of here. So they must have simply hidden him somewhere else. There's nothing to do but start searching. Meanwhile, Rusty and Pete are on the road leading to the farm. A car approaches. Pete says, hey, 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 here comes a car. Maybe we can hitch a ride to that farm. Yeah, it isn't far, but the sooner we get to a phone, the better. The car pulls up beside him. A man leans out and calls, Hey, want a ride, boys? Hop in. How far are you going? Oh, we just want to get to a telephone in a hurry. Last picture, the man replies, Telephone, huh? Hey, wait a second. Sure, hop right in. You get to the telephone, all right? At the police station. I'm a deputy sheriff, and there's a statewide alarm out for two youngsters just like you. Pete exclaims, You, you, you mean we're arrested? Yes, he will. And now Mr. Miles and Tex will know where the boys are at last. Oh, yes, and Tex will come and help them, and then Rusty will tell him where the trophies are hidden, and then they'll rush out to the old house and catch Sir Percival and Nobbs before they leave. Well, let's hope so. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Howdy and all you boys and girls. I got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Bigly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.